Let me introduce you to Prahlad. Prahlad is the youngest boy that I've been involved with rescuing from the child trafficking trade. He was three when we took this photograph. He was very, very sick. And as it turned out, he had a hole in his heart. And actually, to tell you the truth, I didn't think he was going to make it. What would you say if I told you that a corporate finance business working in the investment banking markets was integral in turning around the life of this child and thousands of others? Prahlad was one of 139 kids that we found during the Nepali Civil War who were in the child trafficking trade. Their parents had been desperate to get them out of the way of the violence in the mountains, and so they had put them into the hands of people, believing that these people would take them to Kathmandu and keep them in safety and educate them. And instead, they were trafficked. When we found Prahlad, he was in a room with 21 other kids. There were three beds. Most of the kids had been beaten. Most of the kids had been sexually abused. And all of them were malnourished. His world and that world of child trafficking is about a million miles away from the other world that I inhabit, the world of investment banking. And you might fairly be asking yourself, what on earth has investment banking got to do with the world of child trafficking? Don't those Wall Street types only have interest in the latest series BMW, their next bonus, their jet? The topic of discussion that I want to put out today is the question, is business capable of greatness? Against seemingly overwhelming evidence to the contrary, I want to argue that actually business has all the tools for greatness and all the tools to make a huge positive social change in the world. And I believe that that change is happening. That change is coming now. And we just need to embrace it. I wonder how many of you, when I say the words investment banker, immediately envisage something a little like this. The investment banking industry has bathed itself in dishonor. And unfortunately, what we've seen is we've gone from a world where working for a global investment bank was a matter of huge pride to a world where many investment bankers are actually embarrassed or ashamed to tell people where they work. And in fact, in the States, some senior investment bankers go home under security guard. We live in a world where even leading business media have front page covers like this. And I guess that's not surprising, really, when you think about the billions and billions of dollars that senior executives have paid to themselves as bonuses, stacked up against the trillions of dollars of losses that the global economy has incurred, much of that sheeted home to the very same investment banking industry. And what we've seen in the world, as this has unfolded since the global financial crisis, through the magic of the internet, is the rise of really rage and disgust by ordinary people about the behavior of the private sector in general and the investment banking community in particular. We've seen this most notably evidenced in the rise of the Occupy movement, which took up the phrase of Nobel laureate Joe Stiglitz, we are the 99% to explain the incredible disproportion of wealth in the world. So I asked myself, how is it that business got itself into this position, into this reputational scrap heap that it's in now? And I think actually the answer is quite simple. I think that we have allowed business to define itself incredibly narrowly, for business education to be incredibly narrow. We've been talking to, in, uh, business has been talking, and we've been educating about business, talking about things like profit and margin, return on capital, return on equity, capital adequacy, adequacy ratios, so narrow. We have been allowing business people to come to work and leave their values at the door of the office and then pick them up again when they go home at night. And I guess the bigger question about that is, what can we do about that? You know, what is the answer? And I think, actually, the path to greatness is remarkably simple. I believe that the answer is that we need to encourage business and support business to just stretch out. Stretch out its thinking about its role in the wider world. Stretch out its understanding of why it exists. Stretch out its caring and dreaming about new models. And stretch out and embrace its wider shareholder group. And, and its wider stakeholder group, not just its shareholder. 
To give you an example of a business that has just stretched out, I want to tell you a wee bit about my journey and my business over the course of the last 15 years. My journey began pretty much like this as a young adult. I spent my early adult days very much protesting uh, social injustice and believing profoundly, as I still do, that you should always stand with those who fight for social change. I was studying law. And while I was studying law, I had a moment where I thought, you know, maybe I could enhance what I'm doing with my placards by learning about power and capital, because I know nothing about that. Maybe I could enhance my, my huge passion for social justice by learning about business. And so I swapped my duffel coat and my placard for a suit and a pair of high heels, and I entered the business world. So I had a very lucky career in business as a banker and as a lawyer. I got the chance to advise people on multi-billion dollar transactions as a lawyer, and as a banker, I got the chance to run a bank, have the enormous privilege of being responsible for managing an incredible team and managing a balance sheet. And after a decade of a very lucky career, I realized that I had new eyes. And with those new eyes, those new business eyes and business tools, I could find a way where I could use those tools, combine those tools with my passion for social justice to try and find a way to support others in need. I began to think, I began to think about poverty and what could be done and look at the nonprofit sector. People came from everywhere to help me with this dialogue and debate. And what we began to see was that with three key barriers that many amazing nonprofits face when they're trying to do their incredible work. The first of those barriers was the traditional funding model of nonprofits. Often means that nonprofits are waiting every day desperate for the next donor dollar. They may have very vulnerable client groups on the ground who they have long term commitments to, but if their donor doesn't want to give them money again next year, they're in trouble. So because they have this desperate problem with sourcing funds, what that means is they spend a huge amount of their focus looking at their donor group and what their donors' needs are, and taking away their precious time from looking at the really hard work they're doing trying to service community groups. And so the other thing that rolls out of that is, so often in the great organisations of the world, development experts become fundraisers instead of doing their incredibly important work. The second thing I saw, and this is one that drives me crazy, I have to say, as a business person, is that non-profits are in this position where they are roundly and routinely criticised for their administration costs, for their overhead costs. And the reason this drives me completely crazy is any business person worth their salt knows absolutely well that if you do not have a well-resourced head office and you don't have your overhead covered, you cannot deliver a product or service to save yourself. Yet somehow non-profits are expected to do that with their incredibly complex work. How can you run a car without an engine. The third thing I saw was this really interesting result of the traditional model of funding, which was that it has inbuilt in it this real disincentive for nonprofits to do research. Now, one of the reasons I believe that that's there is, well, first of all, research is expensive. But secondly, when you're dependent on your donor to give you money again next year, you don't necessarily want to be telling him that you did research that shows that you made a whole heap of mistakes. So actually, sometimes it's easier just not to do the research or just not to admit the mistakes. So seeing those three barriers, we began to discuss. Here's the challenge that we had. Nonprofit people together with business people. Could we find a model to bridge the richest places in the world, like Wall Street, with the poorest places in the world? And this picture being a, uh, our most remote project, which is 25 days walk from the nearest roadhead, or was when we did this work. How could we build that bridge? Models, models. There must be a new model. And this is what we came up with. And like I guess all good things, it's surprisingly simple. What we came up with was the idea that we would form an investment banking corporate finance business with the sole purpose of generating money to fund all the overheads and administration costs of our own international development organization that we set up at the same time. So if you like, in essence, the business people would do what they were really good at, making money, and the development professionals would be free to do what they're brilliant at, 
figuring out how to deliver service to people on the ground. So the idea was simple. Let's run an investment banking corporate finance business to advantage the disadvantaged, not to advantage the advantaged. Not that hard, but a whole new model in its time 15 years ago, and we call it business for purpose. And this is what we've learned over the last 15 years of this model, seeing what this model does to nonprofits. As we've worked for 15 years, we have laughed together, we have cried together, we have reached out and stretched together, and we have seen a handful of really interesting results. The first of these is that when you run this model, what happens is 100% of money that any other donor gives you, if you have a, not, a, a business for purpose funding your admin costs, 100% of the project costs that any donor gives you go directly to project. What that means is you never have to have another argument with the donor about admin costs. Every nonprofit who hears that loves that. What it also means is your donors love it. So it's a win-win. And your core costs are covered. The financial viability of the organization is never threatened by other donors. The next thing that we've learned is that if you, go, if, if you can work with a model like this and have a business for purpose sitting against a nonprofit, you can ensure development integrity because all of a sudden your development specialists are freed from the world of dealing with donors. You're dealing with them in head office, which is properly resourced. And moreover, all the core costs of the organization are covered, so your financial viability is secured. What that has meant for us is it's meant that we've been able to be real development contrarians, not say yes to the things that might harm community on the ground that other donors might like. It's allowed for us to be entirely led by community in the work we do with a complete underpinning of best practice service delivery at all times. The next thing we've seen is talking about mistakes. And this was one, I have to say, I never knew I was going to make quite so many mistakes in 15 years. But this has been a really profound one for us um, because we have made a lot. But because of our, our model and our structure and organizations that have this model, you're allowed to talk about your mistakes. It's not dangerous to talk about your mistakes. In fact, what you find is your mistakes inform your work, support your work, and you share them with others so they don't have to make the same mistakes as you did. I have made mistakes at every level, right down to the toilets. And, and it was a very, very depressing day for me when we realized that we'd built a whole load of wonderful pit latrines with community because sanitation was such an important need, but because we'd made all sorts of mistakes in the way that we've, we were involving community in that project, it turned out that they were being used much more for goat sheds than they were for toilets. <laughs> there have been mistakes at every level. Finally, one of the things we've seen is that our work has been able to be research driven and again a nonprofit who is in the lucky situation of having this kind of model can really focus on research in a way that others can't. So we do research down to household level. We don't do community survey groups. We don't do short term research projects. We talk to every single member in a community at household level. That means we can talk to even the most disenfranchised members of a community to get their opinion to allow us to inform our work so that it's right for the whole community. So, what we've shown, what we want to, the, the message I want to give you is just stretching out really works. I want to make this real for you. It's easy for me to talk about the theory, but let me introduce you to Martin, Mildred, and Marvin. They're the first three triplets that were ever born live in our neonate ICU that we manage with a wonderful, extraordinary partner in Uganda. And their birth was a day of huge celebration for us all over the world. And the reason is, in remote settings, tragically, in a multiple birth situation, often mum will die and all her babies will die. Multiple births are dangerous even in the developed, developed world, but they're really, really dangerous in the developing world. So the day these three characters came into the planet and survived, was a really good day for us because we knew that we had crossed into a new threshold of care and we celebrated all over the world. Corporate finance types celebrated with development specialists. Everybody celebrated. And this is them now. Yay! <laughs> They're legends. They're total legends. Can you imagine what it feels like to run a corporate finance business with an outcome like that? So, business for purpose, 
When we began, it was new and it was mad. But in the last 15 years, we've seen this huge evolution, almost a revolution of business thinking around these kind of models. Social business, social entrepreneurship, triple bottom line, B Corps, it's all coming. Change is coming. Change is here. And it's great. One of the other things we've seen is that this is actually great for business because when a business just stretches out, staff love it and consumers love it and regulators love it. And of course, the shareholder loves that those groups love it. So this is really great for the world. I believe that anyone who's involved in trying to just stretch out business thinking around what business does is an agent of change. For us, we've been joined by huge numbers of people and businesses, and they've all been agents of change in the way that we've worked. They've all come from different areas of industry and as individuals. They're as disparate as reinsurance companies, accounting firms, individuals from Uganda, Nepal, America, Australia. They've all come with different motivations. They've all come for different reasons, but they've all come with one impact and result. And that has been, together, we have created our beautiful bridge. So, I bring you back to the question we started with. Is business capable of greatness? And you can tell from what I've been saying that I believe profoundly the answer to that is yes, if business just stretches out. When business stretches out, extraordinary things happen. And my challenge to everybody who's listening to this talk is to say, let's see more business for purpose. Let's see more models. Let's take what's been done in the last decade, the last two decades of thinking about business role and make it bigger, better, and even more impactful. And let's celebrate what business has to give to the world, not just as, fuel, as by way of fueling economy, but also by way of saving lives. I want to give the last word on this model to Prahlad. Prahlad, now 10 years down the track from the time we found him, is an incredibly happy 13-year-old. He spends a huge amount of time whizzing around on his bike like a mad thing. He loves to sing, he loves to paint. He's doing great at school, passing all his exams. And very, very happily, we managed to find his family and reunite him with his family. He is just like your kids. He is the way every kid should be. And the reason he's like that is because a whole lot of people and one business just stretched out. Thank you.